right? We're part of something big. Jesus said he's going to build this church, and as you can see from that living map, he's doing a pretty good job of it. I'm just saying he's doing a really good job. And so we're studying the book of Acts here lately, and I want to welcome you to open up a copy of God's Word and open it up to Acts chapter 3. We're just walking through the scriptures. Uh, Not only is God's Word perfect in its content, but I believe that it's perfect in the way that it's laid out and ordered. And so that's what we do here at our church. We just walk you through the scriptures. And like I said earlier, God uses his word to equip his people for every good work. And so if we can be faithful with the text of scripture, you're going to see great things happen here and through our church. And so we've been studying the book of Acts for about a month or so to the ends of the earth. And really the story of the book of Acts is not just the supernatural giftings of the, of the, uh, of the apostles and all, and all these amazing things that they did, but really it's the story of what the followers of Jesus Christ did and therefore should do in response to who Jesus is and what he said and what he taught. And so Luke... He wrote two books. He wrote one, which is named after himself. We call it the Gospel of Luke. And in in that book, he tells us about who Jesus is and what he said and what he taught. And then the next book is a follow-up letter so that we would see here today at Revolution Church what we are supposed to do in response to who Jesus is and what he taught. And that's exactly what we've been doing. You know, it's amazing. Uh, Just looking at this map and then, of course, your own lives, you know that there's trends and fads and religions and rulers and empires and kingdoms that kind of rise and fall, right? Remember Pet Rocks? Who made up that one, right? A pile of rocks. I mean, millions and millions. So you see, these things rise and fall. Roman Empire, different religions come and go all the time. But somehow, through persecution, you know, um, let's make Bibles illegal. Let's make Christian gatherings like this illegal. Let's burn Bibles. Let's even martyr people like let's kill them if they say they're christians like even through all of that this ultimate kingdom not like the other kingdoms that rise and fall this kingdom of christ somehow marches on but what what makes this christianity thing so special and unique that it somehow is fulfilling this promise of the carpenter's kid from 2,000 years ago where he says in Matthew 16, 18, I'm going to build my church and hell ain't going to stop it. All these other things rise and fall, but yet somehow this guy makes a promise and it still works. And 2,000 years later and 6,500 miles away and now 2 billion strong, this thing just keeps happening. It's like the little engine that could. It just does not stop. But the question is why? Why is this working when all of the things rise and fall, come and go? Why is Christianity working? Now, I asked you to open to Acts chapter 3, and we're going to study verses 1 through 11. But keep your finger there. Just turn one page. I want to tell you what God's Word says about why. Not, not what Moses thinks about why this thing is working, but what does God say about this? Why is This kingdom of Christ, the church of Christ, why is it ever expanding and growing to the ends of the earth? And so in Acts chapter 5, verse 33 through 39 is where our attention is. But let me give you a little context. So the church has just started, right? (coughs) And the early believers, the originals, they start preaching Jesus. And, and And the powers that are there, present, they don't like all that. So they're trying to stop them. And so they've arrested some of these guys and they're standing before the full council of all the most religious experts of the day. And so they're there, they got arrested. And so what does it say here? Um, In chapter 5, verse 33, it says that um, they're talking about preaching and that they shouldn't and this and that, but this they decided to, to kill the apostles for this. So it says here in verse 34, uh, but one member who's a Pharisee, who was the highest of religious authority. They knew the Bible better than anybody. And it says this guy, his name is Gamaliel, or everyone pronounces it different. You can call him G-Money if you want. I don't care. This guy, G-Money, who was an expert in religious law, 
and respected by all the people. They, he stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber, chamber for a while. And then he said to his colleagues, he says, Men of Israel, take care of what you're planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Thetis, maybe, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him. And that's a pretty decent-sized church, isn't it, 400 people? Pretty decent-sized church. Uh, 400 others joined him, but he was killed. Now, you guys remember that Jesus was killed, right? Well, this guy was killed, and all of his followers went their various ways. It just went away. It didn't work, right? The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was this other guy, Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him. doesn't say how many, but he did. And he was killed too, just like Jesus and just like Thetis. And all his followers were scattered. But there's something different about Jesus, isn't there? Because he was killed. But something different's come of it. Verse 38, so my advice is this. Leave these men alone. Leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. Just like the other, just like the other guys, right? He's saying, listen, if it's nothing, just don't pay attention to it. Don't give them an audience. Let it go. It'll fizzle out on its own. But, but if it's from God, you'll not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. That's why it's working. That's why it's working. Um, Job 42.2 says this, I know you can do anything and no one can stop you. Daniel 4.35, he does as he pleases. There is no one who can restrain his hand. See, Acts chapter 5, this guy's telling us the truth. The reason why this is moving to the ends of the earth, the reason why that map was working the way it was, is because God is in it. God's power is present in the moving. And that's why you can't stop it. If God's going to do something, just get out of his way. Because you can't overthrow what he's going to do. That's the overarching reason why this thing is happening. God and his power is moving it. But now back in our text for today, Acts chap that's Acts chapter 5. But Acts chapter 3 in verses 1 through 11, that's going to tell us how that power manifests. How, what it looks like. How does it, and he, God, and his power, how does it show up, right? You could call this message three characteristics, characteristics of an authentic, healthy, ends of the earth reaching church. You could call it that. That's too wordy. So we're just going to see what it says here about how God shows up with his people to move his message and his kingdom to the ends of the earth. And listen, we, all of us, need all of this. We need this in the church to be powerful, okay? So Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And that's what we're doing, right? We're just walking through the text. We've already done the first two chapters in their entirety. We haven't missed any of it. Here we are in chapter 3. Peter and John, they went to the temple one afternoon. What day was that? Was it on the Sabbath? We don't know, right? We don't know if it was on the Sabbath. See, a lot of people think you're supposed to go to church on the, on the Sabbath. You're supposed to go to church on, on, on Sunday or whatever day, you, right? No, no, right? Because the Bible's not afraid to say when Jesus went to the, to the temple on the Sabbath, is it? If you've read it, you know when he went on the Sabbath, it said on the Sabbath Jesus went, right? But that's not what happens here. This is just on any old day, right? That's just all the more reason for you to come on Monday and Wednesday and thir all these different times that you can come and worship and learn. Uh, so they were there at one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. That's convicting, isn't it? As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried. Now you're going to see in Acts chapter 4, that guy was over 40 years old. He's been unable to move or walk for over 40 years, right? You think he's been waiting on a miracle? You've been waiting on something for a long time? How about this dude right here, right? 40 years. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put, like every day? Yeah, every day. Each day he was put, a, put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. 
When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. Look at me. Look at me. The layman looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. You can see him just pulling out his pockets like, I got nothing, man. I got nothing that you'd really want, that you want, but I do have something you need. He says, I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. That's awesome, right? I'm just telling you, if you, if you got that power, because not everybody's got that, right? If you got that, there's a whole hospital down the road that really could use you. Like, don't hoard that for the stage, for a show. Get to the hospital and help somebody, okay? I don't know anybody who's got that one, but God gives out those powers, those gifts, and if you got it, use it. Chapter, uh, verse 7, Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. I love that, too. That's not in my notes, but isn't that awesome how, like, he, he says it, but when, when they said, stand up and walk, he wasn't healed. When was he healed? When they took action to help them. When he took action to do something, put some, put some feet behind the prayer, put some feet behind the proclamation, all of a sudden he's healed as the help is being given. Instantly healed and strengthened, he jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, I'm not going to leap because that would be a bad illustration. I don't want to ruin your day. Walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Sol Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Let's do on that. I did. So I, um, I grew up a Jewish kid, went to temple, went to uh, Hebrew school. And uh, if you were a Catholic kid growing up, you probably went to CCD, right? Well, this Hebrew school is CCD for Jewish kids. It's, um, it's like, it's like um, Jewish Sunday school, right? It's like Jewish Sunday school. And uh, you go to Sunday school when you're a little kid and... and uh, you know, you learn all the stories, right? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, the old Sunday school teacher back there, right? Remember that? She's, she's getting ready to pull her flannel board out any second right now, right? <clears throat> the puppets are coming. The puppets are coming. Brother Noah built the ark. Yeah, you, you learn all these stories, right? It's cool. You learn all the stories. And, 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 and I learned the stories, and I learned the history, but I never, never, ever encountered the God of the stories. And that was a problem for me. See, Gamaliel or G-Money, whatever you want to call the guy, he was spot on when he was talking about these people and God being with them. It's the manifest presence of God with his people. That's what makes a church powerful. And that's what makes its influence greater. And that's what makes its evangelism wider. It's the manifest presence of God with his people. That's where the power is. Moses of old was having a little chit-chat with God. And you can see it back in Exodus chapter 33. And in verse 16, he says this, For your presence among us sets us apart from all other people on the earth. That's what makes it powerful. It's his presence. That's the power. That's the power in the church, right? And so what we see is what Moses had said, what he had mentioned in Exodus 33, it becomes a reality in Acts chapter 3 when the temple of routine becomes a supernatural place which, which in turn changes the people into witnesses of the presence and power of God. And, and that's what stirs up that whole city. 
See, that's what the book of Acts is talking about, is how this gospel starts to get out to the world. And this is what happens. God shows up in the person of Jesus Christ and applies power to those people, and that's what stirs up the city. They were absolutely astounded. That's what caused it. That's what caused it. Listen, 40 plus years of being lame, crippled, not being able to walk, going to the temple. That's the status quo, right? And what are we? We're a revolution. We're supposed to bust out of the status quo. This guy was living in the status quo. Listen to this. Day after day for how many years? No. How many days has he been, has he been coming to the temple, though? Probably not when he was one. Maybe not when he was two. But at some point... I don't even know how many it was, but day after day after day, people had to carry this man, right? They didn't have that. They didn't have a chair on wheels. They had to carry the guy on the mat. So faithful friends would pick the guy up from wherever he was living and carry him to the temple and drop him off outside of the gate. Couldn't go in the gate. Religiously unclean if you're like that. You're not allowed to go into the temple. They sit him outside of the gate away from where God's presence was in the Holy of Holies, out there. That's where you belong. And every day they would drop him off there and he would sit there and beg. And every single day the people would come. You saw it there. They were coming, what, 3 o'clock in the afternoon for a prayer time? Awesome. And every day they would come and there he was. Day after day after day after day, the same people carrying him, the same guy sitting there, the same people coming in, day after day, year after year. And this man was simply settling for the kindness of a coin from a stranger who had been taught repeatedly in church to be kind and compassionate and give to the poor. And sometimes they would. That's awesome. And maybe it fed him for the day, and that was it. But that won't push anything to the ends of the earth. There's no power in that, right? God's presence is the power in the temple, in the gathering of his people. You know what's really, really sad? This is so sad. I grew up in temple, right? I don't know if I shared this with you guys before. I think I have. Inside the temple, like where that cross is, <clears throat> there's a lamp. And nowadays, they light it with a bulb, you know? It's 2019. But back in the day, before they had bulbs, they used to use oil. And that's the eternal light. The eternal light represents his presence in that place. It represents his presence in the place. It's a story of Hanukkah. You guys know the story of Hanukkah? So Hanukkah, there was only one day's oil left. And it was going to run out. And if it runs out, his presence isn't there, right? And so they were trying to get oil. And so there's a war. They had to try to get through the war to try to get to where the oil was. But they couldn't get to it. But miraculously, the oil that was only good for one day, it lasted for eight. That's the miracle of Hanukkah. But listen, the light in the temple represented the presence of God. And that's why when they go to the temple every single day, it's dead. Because they have something that represents the presence of God, but they don't have the presence of God. That's what we need. We need the presence of God in the place. That's what gives it the power. Okay, And so here's how God shows up in our text here that we're studying and into today's church. The first characteristic of a, an authentic, healthy church that gets the gospel to the ends of the earth, here it is right here. It's the first thing, right? The spotlight is on Jesus Christ. That's what has to happen in the church. Okay, John 5, 39, this is what the scriptures say. It says, all of scripture points to Jesus. Colossians 1, 15, Christ is supreme over all creation. Colossians 1.18, Christ is the head of the church. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Since we're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us shed off every sin that slows us down, every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that, that trips us up. 
And let's run the race with endurance that God has set before us. How do we do this? By setting our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. We need Jesus at the heart of our church all the time. John 16, 9. This is so convicting. It says that the world's sin is that they don't believe in Jesus. Of all, think of all the things that you do wrong. All the things that everybody does wrong. All the lack that we have. All the mistakes that we make. Of all the sin that's possible in all of the human race, in all of this world, what's the greatest void for us all? What's our greatest failure? What's our greatest need? What's our greatest problem for all of humanity? Is that we don't have Jesus. That's the greatest sin. That's the world's sin is that it doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. It's humanity's biggest problem. So in the church, can't we let our biggest problem decide our greatest need? We need Jesus Christ. The greatest need of every living soul is Jesus Christ. So at the center of Revolution Church and all that we do is Jesus Christ. We preach Jesus, we pray to Jesus, we worship Jesus, we serve Jesus, and we share Jesus Christ. That's what our church is. Do you want to know what our church is? That's it right there. That's what we do. That's what we're all about. Okay? So look back at our text. Look back at the scene in Jerusalem. They're there at, a temp- at the temple, the temple. Not just a temple, the temple. You know it's adorned in gold and silver, beautiful linens, absolutely stunning church facility. The best of the best. They got the best of everything there, right? Does that make it powerful? You got faithful attenders, right? Showing up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of the week. Who's doing that other than the guy that gets paid to be here? Right? Faithful attenders. They're there all the time, day after day. Odd hours, whenever. They just make it a priority. So they got a beautiful facility and they got faithful attenders. But nothing's, and, and I like that, right? But nothing powerful is happening there. It's lacking power. But notice how power shows up. When two nobodies show up and give what they have. When they, give G- when they inject Jesus Christ into that beautiful facility with faithful attenders, wham, it's game on, right? Then there's power. When Jesus, in whom the fullness of deity is pleased to dwell, that means he's God of gods, okay? When God shows up in the person of Jesus Christ amongst his people and they have an experience with him, that's when there's power in the church, right? That's what makes Christianity distinct. That's what moves it forward to the ends of the earth, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you can turn there if you'd like. There's a couple of verses I want you to see. It illustrates for us what happens. We saw what happens when Jesus is injected into that scene. Guy lame for 40 years stands up and starts leaping. Woohoo! Right? Awesome. Here's another scene. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 and 25, it says this. It tells us that if people come into a church gathering, and and here's the quote, they'll say this. I'll talk about what happens in a moment, but this is what they say. In a church gathering where they claim God is truly here among you. That's the quote, okay? That's what they'll say. And when, when, when they go into a church gathering where God is truly, like, there, moving, living, breathing, ministering, changing lives, transforming people, right? When he's there and you can feel it, right? This is what happens. They'll be convicted of sin. Every one of their innermost thoughts will be exposed. They will fall to their knees and they will worship God. That's what happens when God shows up. See, a lot of people want to go to church just to be encouraged, to be encouraged. Awesome. But when God, when people show up where God is there amongst them, this is what happens. They get convicted of their sin. 
and, and, and everything they've been trying to hide, it's out there before the living, breathing God. He can see every bit of it. And now you can see it for what it's worth. And you realize how flawed you are and how perfect and powerful he is. And you fall to your knees, confess that what you've been doing is wrong, and you will turn your life to Jesus Christ. That's what happens when Jesus is at the center of a church. When Jesus is powerfully present and moving in and through his people, that's when a church grows. It's another Bible verse that I think, I think we miss some of the power in it. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says this, that he can do immeasurably more than we could ask or think by his power at work in us. And we all think about the power that's at work in you. Like, and is that true? Yes, I think that's true. But when you read all these different verses, like here in 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25, and in Acts chapter 3, and a lot of other places in Scripture, isn't it also true that he can do a lot of incredible work by his, by his presence and power in us here. See, we miss all that. We think he's at work in us personally, sanctifying us, letting us become more like Jesus. But what about the power that's at work in us when we gather, when people walk in and they are convicted of their sin, right? And their, their thoughts are exposed and they, and they fall to their knees and they worship him. That's the power at work in us. Corporately, this power in the corporate gathering that I think a lot of us miss. And I think a lot of that in today's society is being missed by substituting this for staying at home and watching awesome, and there's some awesome preachers in this world. There really is. But sitting at home in your living room, in your slippers and bathrobe, watching some guy who knows what he's talking about, you're missing the power of the presence of God amongst his people when they gather. And those things should never substitute you being part of a family of faith. He builds his church when his power and presence is here amongst us. So... <clears throat> One of the ways that God shows up in power is by putting Jesus Christ at the center of your church. Uh, acknowledging that this church is here because he built it. He placed it here. It's by him. It's for him. It's the, all the power that we would ever have is through him. And it's all about him. Right? Less preaching about us and more preaching about who? Him. About him. Right? That's the first thing. Here's the second thing where God shows up in power to move his message to the ends of the earth. We're looking for transformation, not tradition. Transformation, not tradition, right? The radical, tangible, visible change in a person, right? That Listen, when that happens, it draws people to Jesus, because they want to know what's going on inside of you. And it also sends people for Jesus, right? It has a dual effect. When, when God radically transforms a life, someone that you know, right? All of a sudden, you, don't, don't you just kind of been quiet? Like, what's up with that? What's up with that dude? What's up with that lady, right? And so you get drawn towards that thing. But it also, when God transforms a life, as he has in several of you in this room, I see your great desire now, instead of just, working to make a living. Now, like, I gotta go tell people. That's what happens when a life is truly transformed. So the elephant in the room here in this text is obviously this dude, right? Jesus completely transforms this man's life. And, and the people, right, the people that are there, you know, probably some good folks, dedicated people, they go to the temple daily. Um, they're charitable people, right? He wouldn't be going there every day if he wasn't getting anything, right? He's obviously getting something at the beautiful gate or else he wouldn't go. He'd find a new spot, right? So obviously they're charitable people, dedicated people. But he changes this guy's everything and the people every day. Every day, every day. Good place, good practices, but no power. But now all of a sudden, when, when Jesus' power shows up in the temple, what does it say? They're absolutely astounded, right? This is probably a really, I actually wrote this in my notes. Weak illustration, but it's the best I got. That's what it says, right? We do the best I can with this. How many people have Apple phones in here? 
a couple Apple people. The rest of you guys are maybe not even going to heaven. I don't even know. I'm just not sure. I know I'm not quite, quite sure you can go to heaven without an apple, but I, I'm just kidding. How many, so you got apples, right? You got apples. So, you know, you got these updates all the time, right? You guys do the updates? Do you do the updates? Sometimes? Okay, I got an old phone. I got an, S, I got an Apple SE. It's probably like, what is that, from Radio Shack or something, right? Did they sell that at Toys R Us? It's an old Apple, right? It was the... It was the six brain inside a five body. I mean, it's, it's, it's little, it's, it's teeny, right? Okay, and so sometimes you get updates, right? <clears throat> and updates, they, they, they don't t radically change your phone, right? But they, they, they tweak it. You see, it says, uh, download this update because we've worked out some bugs. And, and this, like, it's just, you, you know, it's usually about the same phone, but it just kind of tweaks it a little bit, right? That, that, that's what happens, right? Some of those updates help, and right, some of them don't. <laughs> You're just like, dang, I didn't wish, I wish I hadn't got that update. I hate it like this, right? And it changes your phone a little bit. Some help, some won't, but they're usually not a massive change. But here, here's, I'm talking about radical transformation. I'm talking about not, not a little update on my SE. See, my SE is like six years old. It's that big. It's got 12 gigs of memory. If I update it, eh, that's cool. But if I change from an SE to like this new iPhone 11 Pro with triple 4K lens video capability and 512 gigs of memory, I could put a life of movies on this thing, and they're all in 4K, right? It's 1,500 bucks. That's a lot of money, but I was talking to Meredith. A couple years ago, we were thinking about getting some good cameras so we could go live in here and stuff. A good camera that would record in 4K, that was like four grand. Now I can buy an iPhone, stick my phone on that tripod, and I can get 4K for 1,500 bucks, plus the phone, plus texting, plus internet, all that stuff, 1,500 bucks. But there's a massive difference between a tweak, an update on my phone, that's this little nothing thing that can't hardly do anything to go into an iPhone 11 Pro that can do all this stuff, right? So do you understand what I'm saying? There's like a massive difference. We're not talking about little tweaks. We're talking about a radical transformation. And so when Jesus shows up in power and radically transforms an entire life, that draws people and it also spreads the gospel. And so in the church, we don't need self-help sermons and five pointers to a better you, right? That's like an iPhone update. And that doesn't do anything for anybody, okay? Nothing. People need the life-transforming power found only in Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus. And when they find that, that life is massively changed. And it also affects other people around us, right? Ends of the earth. That's what we're looking for. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants us to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. How does one little dude or one little lady be a witness to the ends of the earth? He, that can happen if he radically transforms you. That can happen. See, people want to know what's going on when you're radically transformed. When you're told, how many people, honestly, right? How many people are just watching this Kanye West thing and going, what in the world? Does anyone know who I'm talking about? Kanye West is the most famous entertainer on the planet. For the rest of us old folks, we don't know who he is, right? He is by far the most famous entertainer on the planet. And he is all about, he is a billionaire. He is the most, you think Donald Trump's arrogant? You take, take a look at some old clips from Kanye West, right? Recently, Jesus invaded his life. He's come out, I'm not singing anymore, public, like regular stuff. Everything I do is for Jesus. He just released his new album yesterday. It's called Jesus is King. What? Yeah. Jesus is King. What? It's crazy. But listen, listen, listen. When, when a life like that gets transformed, when you go from the height of material, he's a billionaire, right? And he would flaunt his arrogance. That's what his... You know like The Rock, The Wrestler, the, and, and Stone Cold, the more arrogant and more repulsive they were, the more people liked them? 
That was Kanye. The more he did, the more awful stuff he did, the more people, because we're broken people, right? So we, the more rotten you are, the more we like you. So now he's like, I'm not doing that anymore. He came, I was watching last, I, I've been up since 3.30 in the morning. I was watching him on Jimmy Kimmel. That's what he was talking about. He's like, I used to be this guy. Now I'm this guy. Everything I do from now on, I work for Jesus. Amen. It was awesome, right? And when that happens, a radical transformation, not just like Jesus gets tucked into the nooks and crannies of your life, a little bit of Jesus here, a little bit of Jesus there. No, when you're like, I am this guy, but then I met Jesus, stand up and walk, like totally different now, that attracts people. And they want to know what's going on in this guy. That's why a guy like me could be up. I've never listened to a single one of his songs. He is the most famous and downloaded, rich entertainer on the planet. I've never heard one of his songs. But here I am at 3.30 in the morning with tears coming down my face watching this guy. Like, what is going on? That's what, that's what happens when Jesus transforms a life. And when it transforms life, not only we, like me, up at 3.30 in the morning, attracted to that thing, but now he, this guy, since he's been transformed, he's now on mission. And he's now hitting every single TV show he can to promote Jesus as king. That's what happens when you're radically transformed by Jesus Christ. But a temple that, or a church that teaches, you know, just behavior modification, do better, be better, and and then you'll be better, right? You are better then. That lacks power. That lacks power. We're looking for transformation not tradition. But let me, let me tell you what a church with power looks like. So if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you were there earlier when the, when the people show up, right? Sure, certainly God is there amongst you. Well, think about this. They show up. They're convicted of sin all of their inner thoughts are exposed, like on the screen. Like, Tracy, I know what you're thinking right now, right? I, can you imagine that? Would that be good? No. Wouldn't be good. I know every thought you have, and they're on the big screens now. And you realize, oh my, that's who I am, that's the way I live? I'm sorry. And you fall to your knees, and you confess your sin, and you worship the Lord. That's what a church service is supposed to be. And we've morphed it in our culture into a place where I want to be encouraged. I want to be encouraged. And if I don't walk out of here feeling better about myself and who I am, then preacher, maybe you're not preaching what you're supposed to preach. But look at that scene. Are these people being told how to get better? No. Actually, if you look at it, it's, it's telling them how desperately they need Jesus and his saving grace. That's what happens when God shows up. See, a real church helps people change for sure. Not by buttering them up, but by continually, constantly moving eyes back to Jesus for weekly and daily realization of their lack of righteousness and Christ's grace for such lack. That's what a church is supposed to do. The Apostle Paul, everyone would agree that God will, that, that, that Apostle Paul will be in heaven when you get there. Can you agree to that? We all agree to that, right? For sure? Yeah. And Paul says this in Romans 7. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do want to do, I don't. Well, who can help me from this miserable life of sin and death? Thank God the answer is Christ Jesus. (laughs) We need the power of God in, in our church. So Jesus is the focus. Jesus transforms lives. And here's the third thing we'll see in the text. Jesus destroys dividing walls and builds true community. True community. I don't mean like where I live in the Groves, as a, the Groves community, where we, what we have in common is a, um, geography. 
that we all live in that subdivision. Like, no, that's not real community. Okay? Real community is centered around something powerful. Do you know that it's not that we're weird, even though the Bible says we're peculiar people? Don't you know that Christians are weird? You're weird. You're weird. We're, I know a lot of you, y'all are weird. Let me tell you what I'm talking about, right? We can get this from, this is biblical. Look at verse 4 of our reading. What does he say? Look at us. He says, look at us, right? Look at us. But in verse 12, why are you staring at us? <laughs> They're weird, right? This is, this is in the Bible. Look at me. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> but, but it's not that we're weird that builds community, right? That we're not building community around being weird. What we're building community around is welcoming all people. See, that's what marks true Christian community. Jesus is our example, right? Jesus ministered to hookers and lepers and crazy people. Look, he ministered to dead people. He ministered to, G- to Jews. He ministered to Gentiles. Do you know that, that there's two races I learned? I, was, I knew this, but I never really heard it. Do you know there's only two races in this whole world? Did you know that? Jews and Gentiles, right? See, we construct all... I was listening to this guy, Vody Bauckham, last night. This is what I'm, I've been up all stinking night, man. All night! And he's like, this is the black man. He's like, what, what's this African-American thing? Who made that up? Who decides this stuff? We do? Or does God? See, if, if, the, if the inerrancy of scri- if Scripture is perfect and God is the one who created all things and he's in charge, listen, there's only... Two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. That's it. You know how he says, you know why I think I know this is stupid? Because a black person can come to America, and what are they called? African Americans. Really? But someone from Egypt isn't? What happened there? Why are they African Americans? Why are they not Egyptian Americans? And how about the Moroccan Americans that are here? That doesn't happen. We name stuff, and it creates division. Listen. So from now on, when someone says, what race are you? Yeah, someone said it. Say human. Human race. Okay. Do you know that there's, there's less than 1% difference DNA-wise between me and unique? Less than 1% of difference in our genetic makeup. She just has more melanin than me. That's it. She's the darkest white girl in the world. And I'm the whitest black guy there is. Because we're just humans. We're people, right? But according to God, there's only two different groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. And Jesus ministered to both of them. He he ministered to religious people. He ministered to non-religious people. And that's why... With Jesus as his leader and his example, the Apostle Paul, who said, follow me as I follow Christ, he's following in the exact footprints of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.11, this is what Paul says. In this new life, right, as Christians, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're circumcised or not, if you're barbaric or uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters. That's what we round our wagons around. Jesus Christ the Lord. He is the reason for our community. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, God desires for everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Matthew 28.19, Therefore go and make disciples of all peoples. Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's all people. See, Jesus Christ died for all people, so we as his disciples need to make him available to all people. That is our community. And see, the world is so different. Common worldly culture separates people, and it's so, it's like a cancer in our nation. It's a cancer that the church that Jesus can solve. Common culture separates people, man, woman, young, old, black, white, Democrat, 
Republican, South, North, rich, poor, blue collar, white collar, good, bad, I'm American, I'm German, I'm Italian, I'm this, I'm that. But Jesus unites with the body of Christ, right? The body of Christ, Galatians 3.28 says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile. In the body of Christ, listen, God said there's only two groups of people on this entire earth. There's Jewish people that are circumcised. Listen, did you know that Abraham, I learned this last night, I never even thought about it. Abraham, the first Jew, he wasn't born that way. It's not a genetic thing. God made him a Jew. Circumcision started. He identified people, and that's when he started this thing. There's only two groups of people in the whole world. There's Jew and Gentile. But Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there's no longer Jew or Gentile now in the body of Christ. There's no longer slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ. This is so countercultural. The church, I, I shared this with you guys a, a month or so ago. My brother Jerome in the back, I love him, right? Black guy. He says, hey, Moses, you know your church is a white church? That's what, the, that's what everybody in town thinks. Like, that broke my heart. A white church? I don't want to be a white church. I don't want to be a black church either. I want to be a Jesus church, right? Where everybody's welcome at the table. I don't care who you are, right? Just come. Come and eat. Come and feast. Come and drink. Anybody. But this is so countercultural where we are always forced to divide. So look what happens here in, in our story here in Acts chapter 3, right? They go up to this guy who's the social outcast, and they go up to him, and it says that they looked at him intently earnestly, eagerly, listen, I have, you have my attention, right? Not just some passing little guy in the street that's, that's homeless and hungry and you just flip him a dollar and leave, like, no, I'm looking at you. You're my attention right now. You mean something to me, right? That's what these guys are doing, looking at him intently. They realize the guy's importance, even though he was not like them, even though he was not part of the group that's allowed in the temple, right? They were, he was a social outcast. But he says, they looked at him intently, and then look, I'll give you what I have. That's so awesome. I'll give you what I have. And he offers him Jesus Christ. And then look, Peter took the lame man by the hand. Like just getting down with him and Helping him. This is what this is what this was the irresistible force that converted the Roman Empire. They couldn't understand why Christians were always helping people. This is the community of Christ. Peter takes him by the hand, right? And then they took him into the temple with them. Who knows who he is? Crippled, disheveled. Stinky, whatever. I don't know what it was, but just think of what we have nowadays on our street corners begging, right? Do you ever deal with a lot of the homeless people? I do all the time. They stink. Their clothes are gross. They smell. They haven't brushed their teeth in months. They stink. There's a, there's a distinct homeless odor. You guys probably know what I'm talking about. It's rancid. And these guys went to that man, look at me, I want to help you. And they gave him what he needed, and they took him by the hand, and they brought him into the temple, brought them to church. This guy was socially unacceptable, religiously unclean, financially under-resourced, yet he is now invited and welcomed and helped in the name of Jesus. He goes from outcast to embraced, in just a moment. Awesome, awesome. See, here's the thing. Humans are tribal. We all know it. We like to hang out with people that are like us. That's just the way it is. That's the way we are. And God wants to fight that temptation. Did you ever notice that there's ethnic neighborhoods? I mean, we don't talk about this stuff because then, you know, that's uncomfortable, you know? But, you know, this, why, why are there neighborhoods that are, like, predominantly, like, I'm from Massachusetts, so up in Boston, there was, like, Southie, and, like, there's, there's areas, like, these are Irish people here, right? 
And, and listen, if you're Italian, do not go there, right? Don't go there. And, and listen, if you're white, do not go to Roxbury or Mattapan or Dorchester. It is black. That's just the way it is, man. Why is that? Why is it that my town, like Sharon, Massachusetts, why is it that it's predominantly white Jewish people? Like, what happened there? Is it just like by chance that all of a sudden everyone Jewish moves in there? No, because we're tribal. We like to hang out with people that are like us, right? We don't think like Peter and John right there. We don't think like a Christian should, welcoming those that are different than us. Ethnic neighborhoods, economic neighborhoods. When was the last time you saw like a, just a colossal 10,000 square foot palace house with the neighbor is a double wide and then on this side is a single wide? just doesn't happen that way, right? Because, see, listen, now it's called something, we put a positive twist on it. It's called deed restricted, right? Deed restricted. That means if you're poor, I don't want you near me. That's, that's, what, it mean, that's what deed restricted means. But in our culture, deed restricted is good. We have an HOA. We want to protect our little castle. We don't want to let the outcast in, the poor people. You know, here, so here, here's the thing. Where I live, years ago, there was a, um, did you ever hear of Sunrise Ark? You know what Sunrise Ark is? Sunrise Ark is an organization here in Leesburg, and they minister and help to uh, special needs people with like severe social issues they cannot deal in general public. Like they just can't do it. You know, highly autistic people, things like just cannot function, right? So they have group homes. They wanted to open up a group home in our community. And people were signing petitions to not have them there. I was like, what? Wait, well, oh, so, oh, because you're normal, you get a piece of the American dream, but they're retards, so they can't? I had people hate, I had death, I had people writing letters to me, because I wrote, I stood up and I spoke. I said, what's wrong with you people, right? You guys can have, I can have a piece of the American dream, have my little castle over here, but the, sorry guys, but the retards can't? Because this is what they were calling them. What's wrong with, what's up with that? Deed restricted. Come to our neighborhood. It's deed restricted. We won't let the riffraff in. That's what we do. We're tribal. And the saddest thing is that's what churches are. Was it Billy Graham that said that Sunday's the most segregated day in America? It's awful. And Jesus Christ came to kill all of that and to break down these walls of separation and build community around one thing, him, him. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that whosoever, right? Whosoever, right? Rich, poor, young, old, black, white, purple, green, does blue collar, white collar, ring around the collar, doesn't make any difference. Anybody can come, right? That's what God says. And so God placed us together here as Revolution Church. Why? Well, we're uh, supposed to be reaching the ends of the earth with the gospel, right? That's our task. That's what we're supposed to do. And, and maybe, just maybe, the ends of the earth for us might be sending missionaries to some third world nation out there that, you know, up on the, on the side of a mountain somewhere or, or out in a jungle somewhere, out in the plains of some third world nation where they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. That might happen. That might be you sitting here in this church today. Or maybe the ends of the earth might be a guy who walks into the community coffee house this week who just lost his job and he feels hopeless to provide for his family. He's living without hope. Or perhaps it's a mom in the pickup line at the school who has many kids from many men struggling to get by, can't hardly pay her rent, living in shame because of her past, and she feels depressed and lost because she feels alone with no one to help or to talk to. But no matter what the story is, the greatest need for the entire human race is Jesus Christ. And he created us. And he can provide for us. 
and he can help us, and he can comfort us, and he wants us to share him with all people because they all need him. So Jesus must be at the center of all we do here at Revolution Church so that he can radically transform lives when we gather. And in so doing, a beautiful and loving community of faith will grow and we'll be able to accomplish the mandate of Jesus Christ to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, I, uh, I think I know what you want. I think you've made it quite clear in your word what you want for our church. So, Lord, I, am, I've, I, I feel impressed to just pray this. As we make much of you, Jesus, and do what we can to help people's eyes be fixed upon you. But Lord, as we do that, we would plead with you to bring your power and your presence here to this church. Like a city on the hill, a place of hope, place of help a place of power a place where you draw people to yourself and send people to those who are lost that's what we need here in this church Lord if you'll show up in power your mission that you have us on will be accomplished for isn't it your presence amongst us that makes us distinct from all other people. So Lord, we do sing good songs and we do our best to preach the best that we can. But it's your presence that we need. So when people walk in here, they will know that you're here and say certainly God is here amongst them. Now Lord, as we turn our attention to the act of sacrificial giving and worship in that way. We once again would ask that you would lead us individually in the way that we would give to partner with you so that your gospel can reach the ends of the earth, so that we could continue to do the work you've tasked us to do and in greater measure and in greater impact. That is our desire here. And so, Lord, as we give, that is the motivation for our giving. But we would ask you by your Holy Spirit that you would lead us each individually in the way that we should give. And then, loved ones, there's some baskets that will come around the room. There's boxes on the back walls. You can give at the little kiosk in the lobby under the big screen. You can give whatever way you feel led, but I would only ask you to give as your led to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. So Lord, we're going to just listen to you for a few moments and give you the space that you deserve and the space that we need to hear from you in this area of giving.